Like I worry sometimes because I think you figure out how to make money off of this thing that you love, but then it becomes like even more all-encompassing. Oh, those are so good, those treasury sides. Just a dollar? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna get this Superman one. It's so much fun that Ed hasn't been here before. I didn't realize that he hadn't been here before. He is gonna lose his mind whenever we get to the basement. Well, you know, man, the, like the size of that hip hop comic I'm working on is gonna be like around this size. Dude. Oh, really? So I want to like steal like all this kind of shit. Especially even just to figure out for scale. Yeah, you know, no doubt. Ed, Ed, um, I think I would make you like the first one out of us who managed to like twist a publisher's arm into making like a treasury size. Well, that's just my uh, Hi, Tom. Hey, Ed. Hey, how's it going? What's going on, sir? Good to see you. Me, Todd. You too. This is Todd. What's up, Ed? How's it going? Good to see you, man. You too, you too. You guys are digging um, in already. Very nice. <laughs> I'm an entrepreneur at heart, I've learned. And an entrepreneur isn't necessarily always about business, it's about opportunity. So I got interested in comics in high school. A good friend of mine turned me on to it. I very rapidly discovered the business side of it. Summer between my junior and senior year in high school, I opened up a wee little store. And college, I majored in business, and during college, kept the store running. After college, decided there's no better time in my life to try this for real. My first store was uh, my hometown, Elwood City. Uh, so it wasn't vibrant, but uh, managed to make it work. My attitude was if I could make something work in a small town like Elwood, I could make it work anywhere. This batch of comics is about 100 boxes I got from the Chicago Comic Con. Behind you are things, uh, this is stuff that's uh, going to the basement. These are going to be dollar oldies. Somebody who's nostalgic for the cave kids will absolutely be thrilled to spend a dollar for that. This is an example of something we would toss on eBay. Because like, no one's walking into my stores screaming for Jane's Addiction stuff. But I'm to a point where if I've never seen that book before, that has some sort of merit. One of the tricks I'll do for grab bags is I'll make sure there's a nice book on the front. Something moms can relate to, Spider-Man, Wonder Woman. And then on the back of the pack, I'll very often, just put something a little, maybe not quite as sexy, but semi-sexy. People know what Star Trek is, something they're familiar with, something shiny. That's shiny. Shiny is one of my rules. The other pile is uh, guts. <laughs> my. Everyone knows I call them that too. They're just things that are gonna go in the interior of a grab bag. And that's just one of the ways I make this bulk go away. This is something I've determined is, a, is better than a dollar. You know, I'm, I'm the guy that makes this judgment. I, I determine the destiny of this comic book. The boom of the 80s and 90s produced a lot of books. They're all coming back in and I'm buying them all. Ooh, it's, like, it's like the pit, the pit boss at a casino. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta see this <laughs> I've always believed that back issues are a part of a comic book store. One of the advantages I have certainly is Elwood City, not exactly expensive to have space here. So at some point I realized I've got all these comic books in the basement doing nothing. I need to have some sort of sale. Yeah. So you yeah. thought this was a lot of comic books. Right. <laughs> Follow me. It's been tremendous fun to have the dollar sale be an event. People play on their vacation around it, they'll take days off work. I've had people come here from Toronto. I've had people come here from Alabama. There's, there's some strategizing that needs to go on with a lot of these folks. One of the misconceptions is if I have almost half a million books, they must all be junk. The truth is, I go out of my way to thin out the junk. Um, I've got a lot of good stuff. So one of my favorite Jack Kirby series is 2001, A Space Odyssey, and it picked up after the film left off. And one of the things that's interesting about back issues is this will never be reprinted because the rights are tied up in a lot of different places. But this issue in particular, number five, features a character in a virtual environment and it's almost like this Jack Kirby critique of the superhero genre. Oh uh, yeah, that's excellent, yeah. It's hard to resist a giant reprint Siegel and Schuster Superman. Like these are old uh, Superman comics from like the, the 40s that are reprinted you know, in the 70s, so I guess that was what made it like special coll collector's edition. This is your chance to get these you know, uh, stories that you only heard about from your parents and now you can have them yourself. It was a dollar when it came out and it's a dollar now. I mean, I never bought into that whole, uh, you know, comics as an investment thing. I just, I buy them to read them. Then they started with that deluxe edition. So I don't know what the difference is, but. I have to have yeah. these. Um, what I liked about like those Marvel universes, my brother had those when I was a kid. And what I liked about them was like, I didn't actually have to read comics. I would just like read about characters and get ideas like what they were. Jim. Wow. <laughs> like where would you find that anywhere else? Oh shit, that's his heart. Oh yeah, yeah. He's still a man, Ed. Still, he's still got a heart that beats. Sin eater. <laughs> like, he probably popped up in that one issue yeah, that they describe and that's right. it. Because I'm not a huge comic book fan, I actually work and I don't stop and read all of the books that I come across, so. <laughs> I, I'm a little bit more efficient maybe because of that. Yeah, it's crazy, man. Like, it's like sensory overload. This, man. <laughs> you ever see it? Like, 
I remember getting this comic like for this back cover, man. That's that's Klaus, dude. That's like the first Klaus shit I ever seen, man. Wow. And it was this promised collection of the Ugly Family comic strip. Like ran in Cracked Magazine. And they were gonna put it all under, you know, one roof, and uh, never came out, man. <laughs> oh my god. There's enough of these <laughs> for each of us to have seven. This is Wizard's hottest, most sought after comic book. <laughs> Circa 1993. <laughs> it's really hard for me not to buy every one of these and put them on my wall. Yeah, here it is. These are some of my comics. This era of Godland for me is like my most fondly remembered because this was like my first time to do my own like color comic. Like that was such a big deal going from doing like black and white comics to doing color comics. And yet it is interesting seeing like your work in this this context like it makes it seem like legitimate like you're you're a real comic there's also the thing of the idea of like oh you're consigned to the the bargain bin but uh you know this is where everybody everybody ends up what would it be like to find your own stuff in a dollar sale emotionally or oh it's devastating it means people don't like your work we're gonna look for street angel street angel was my first comic they have a few of those Street Angel number four. They're missing a couple of issues. Ah, Street Angel number five. First appearance of Aphrodisiac. It's just exhausting. Like every time I come to this, by the time I leave, I'm depressed. You know, you think like, oh, I'm not gonna make a comic book that's better than, you know, those Jack Kirby comics. And they just like rot and nobody even knows they exist. It's like my favorite stuff Jack Kirby does. That's one of my favorite things ever, an explosion. I have this, this Tumblr page where I put uh, one single isolated comic book panel up every day. Some of it's like for my own enjoyment, but some of it's kind of, I guess, like to study just the small mechanics of comics, like layout and composition and the way things are put together and arranged. And I think like stuff's never gonna go away. Like, like Hercules Unbound. Hercules is never gonna be bound. You're never gonna bind Hercules. What I'm working on now is um, gonna be like around this size. And it's the way that I'm formatting it is to kind of look like it was pulled out of time from around this era. It's like about the history of hip hop and it's very comprehensive and everybody would talk to me and just say like, oh man, the, the research you're doing, the research, the research. And it's like, okay, sure it's research, but it's it's pleasurable. Like, like I do it for fun. And like, ooh, imagine the back cover with like, if this is NWA or like Run DMC or something. But to be very fair, this is the first comic book I ever got. And I was about five years old. Who gives a five-year-old girl this comic book? Okay, so to be fair, I really never did get into them. Because of that, you think it was the wrong comic book that someone gave you? Because it scared the hell out of me. No, I think back in the day, somebody gave this to me because it was a number one. And it was like, ooh, shiny cover. Did you save it? I did, I did, but not really because... it's worth a dollar now. Yeah. No. Like, on the way here, there's a lot of enthusiasm, but by the time I leave, it's just like, my dream's over. This is it. I'm leaving, I've had enough. As soon as I look up this one Wolverine comic that I came here for. They have a ton of copies of Destroyer Duck number one. And this is a comic I think everybody should have. Uh, Steve Gerber was in a lawsuit with Marvel Comics over ownership of Howard the Duck. To pay his legal fees, he recruited Jack Kirby to draw a comic that they would publish and use all the proceeds to pay his lawyer. It's so subversive and um, anti-corporate. Howard the Duck goes to some other dimension where he's eaten alive by a corporation and harvested in every possible way. He, uh, you know, comes back to his home dimension and tells his friend Destroyer Duck, uh, Duke, who's sort of like a, like a tough guy duck, and he comes back to get revenge. That's just like such a perverse image. Anthropomorphic duck plucked of his feathers. Like there's just something like awful and obscene about it that you can't quite put your finger on. Such a great comic, pretty awesome. I already have this, so I'm, I'm not getting it, but I think all these guys should get a copy.